Hello, Prime Log, uh, Prime Media viewers uh, in Ethiopia, uh, and for those of us that follow us um, elsewhere, uh, welcome. Uh, today, I have a guest with me. Um, uh, I am uh, very honored um, to welcome Mr. Nicola uh, DeMarco uh, from New York. Um, I am very happy uh, that you're joining us, Mr. Nicola, welcome. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank I'm a Siganalo. Yes. <laughs> um, so today um, I'm gonna give him the chance to introduce himself, but uh, I just wanna briefly say that um, I was interested uh, when I saw uh, Nicola's um, uh, handles where he was talking about what's going on in Ethiopia and I was intrigued with some of the things uh, that he was talking about. Um, I would like to give you a few minutes to let us know a little background about yourself, uh, what do you do, and uh, what's your connection to Ethiopia, and uh, kind of introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you very much, Ledet. I am so honored to be here tonight and to be sharing this information that I've gathered with you. Uh, I want to start with 1996, when I first traveled to Ethiopia, I was part of a group of people training teachers in Ethiopia. And what brought me to Ethiopia was not just the invitation to go, but uh, an interest that I had, uh, starting with my grandfather, who I'm named after, Nicola. Uh, his, his last name is Scavina, and uh, mine, of course, is DiMarco. He, as a 30-year-old, uh, was duped and lied to by Mussolini to go to Ethiopia and, quote-unquote, settle there with uh, Mussolini's Italian uh, army. And he was not in the military. He was a shopkeeper. So that kind of interest was in my mind. And uh, our family nearly moved uh, there. I don't know if I would have ever been born if they did that. Um, then there were other interests in my life, including uh, uh, reggae music and the philosophies of Bob Marley. And reading about him and his philosophy of music that I loved, I was so intrigued that that had something to do with my grandfather's experience. So to put it all together in college, I took courses in Africana studies and learned about you know, uh, the reaction of Americans to the Italian invasion of Ethiopia and therefore, uh, when I visited, I had a lot of information. I have a law degree, I studied law. So uh, what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is kind of the combining scientific reasoning with legal reasoning, because as we know in science, if you have an, a hypothesis, you look for a proof for that hypothesis to either prove or disprove that hypothesis. and um, you know, it concerns me very much that um, Ethiopia is not being understood uh, by the world. Uh, so for years, it's concerned me. And especially now that there is uh, a trouble in the country that uh, the prime minister is, is uh, addressing regarding the uh, Tigray region. I, I also wanted to read to you a quote that defines my philosophy of activism and life and the way I see change. And it's from Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, he said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. With, with that in mind, uh, I'm you know, approaching 57 years old and I want to make sure that my country, the United States of America, stands by its friend and ally, Ethiopia, and doesn't take rumors as fact. Uh, what I'm concerned about, Ledet, is that the tactics used by Trump, where he plants a lie, such as Obama was not born in America, and then pretends that he read it somewhere else and says, oh, people are saying this and therefore I must investigate it. Similar tactics seem to be taking place right now with regard to Ethiopia. Um, with that said, um, 
you know, I, I'd love to take your questions and give you my research. I can't hear you. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so with that said, um, my first question was, you were the first person that I actually saw uh, who dissected um, the situation um, that was reported by Amnesty International uh, in regards to um, Aksum uh, massacre. I, I do wanna point out, obviously, this is not um, uh, a discussion uh, based on whether there is any suffering in, in, in the Tigray region. As we know, there is a lot of suffering, a lot of um, uh, victims. Uh, anytime there is any conflict or any type of law enforce enforcement, um, operation. It's the innocent people that suffer um, um, more than um, more than anything. You know, um, services such as um, uh, health facilities, uh, not being able to provide um, food security, um, and uh, looting and so forth. You know, just the regular um, uh, chaotic situations can bring a lot of um, uh, hurt and pain to uh, innocent civilians. So having said that, um, uh, there was a lot of uh, chatter about, you know, about the amnesty report uh, being uh, not, not containing facts or not containing enough facts. And I saw uh, the detail um, questions that you uh, brought upon that report. Uh, and uh, I would like to give you the chance um, because I know you are a, a fan of Amnesty for all the works that they have done. This is not to, um, to discredit the good work they have done, but then I think um, because the world relies on, you know, people's work, uh, people's reputations, sometimes, um, uh, you know, uh, mistakes happen or sometimes things are done on purpose and people really rely on these types of information for policies and so forth. So please tell me um, in detail uh, the things you found out uh, yes. about the report. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much. And as you said, I have an immense respect for both Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. And that is exactly why I asked them to bring solid corroborated proof, including video, audio, or cell phone photos to the public if they have them of any alleged uh, massacre in the city of Axum. Uh, when we talk about the city of Axum, I think it is so important for people outside of Ethiopia, as well as people in Ethiopia who already appreciate this, but especially people outside of Ethiopia and America in particular, to appreciate the significance of the city. The city is a World Heritage Site under the United Nations. It is a holy city. It is the capital, if you will, of the ancient kingdom of Aksum. If you were to say there is a massacre in Aksum, it's the equivalent of saying there was a massacre at the Vatican. Or, or Mecca, or a holy place that people uh, venerate, and they, as they should. And I uh, have immense respect for Axum, uh, as I didn't mention tonight, but I have mentioned in, on the um, my Twitter account. I worked with the Axum Obelisk Return Committee. I was a member, and I was invited on to the Axum Obelisk Return Committee by Dr. Richard Pankhurst, who I had the honor of meeting in 1996. So my appreciation for the city and understanding any accusation about a massacre, how, how it resonates and how it could be used, it could be used to incite hatred, to incite passions, to get people to focus on a particular false, possibly, rumor. Um, so with that said, again, I don't want to uh, denigrate Amnesty International. I just want to focus on giving them pretty much some feedback on the context that I saw their presentation. Now, their report uh, was released publicly and to the government of Ethiopia on February 18th. 
and anyone who knows about Ethiopian history, February 19th is the anniversary of the Graziani massacre in the center of Ethiopia in 1937 by the Italian invaders. So each year, this is a national day of observance, an international day of observance. In fact, one that I participate in every year. And what that involved was a, a massacre by the Italian military of thousands of innocent Ethiopians. So the, with the report coming out on the 18th, I wonder were people unwittingly or wittingly, knowingly or unknowingly, used by the insurrectionists in Tigray to stir emotion around this holiday time. Um, with that said, uh, that is the amnesty report. Around the time of the amnesty report, on three separate dates, January 15th, a report came out not the amnesty report, but an article by something uh, called the Christian Times. Now, there, I'm purposefully not giving you links because I don't want to give them more publicity and ability for them to keep pushing this rumor. But it's interesting. This January 15th report said that churchgoers in Axum were massacred by Eritrean troops churchgoers. That, the Amnesty Report does not say churchgoers, but this January 15th report by the Christian Times says this. And if you look down at the bottom of this very emotional, insightful, you know, false report, it says in its own writing, it says, and I'll read it and I'll quote it, this report continues to be based on one source, which was unclear about the cause of the massacre or the perpetrators. The Church Times, that's the our news organization, quote unquote news organization, is actively seeking verification, but the insecurity of the region is making this difficult. After the 15th, they didn't follow up because it did not happen. But that didn't stop two more reports a month later in February, on February 23rd and February 20th, 20th and 23rd, from coming out in the New York Post. Now, the New York Post is notoriously a pro-Trump uh, conspiracy right-wing uh, newspaper. And those two reports, three days apart, both said there was a massacre in the churches in um, Axum. And one of them actually says that people died trying to protect the Ark of the Covenant. None of this happened, and the amnesty report doesn't even say that. But what I'm uh, seeing is a, a, a context, a almost like a smear, not almost, it is a smear campaign. Uh, and the question is, who is who is cooperating deliberately, and who is being an unwitting, you know, a partner in this in this public relations campaign is is what I'm concerned about. Um, so with that said, I want to emphasize very strongly that I recognize and have, you know, I support uh, the study that just started this past week by the United Nations and the Ethiopian Human, Human Rights Commission to review all of this and to get the facts and understand what is going on, not just in Axum, but throughout uh, the Tigray region. Uh, so what I wanted to also say uh, to you, Ledette, and to the, to the audience is I have been in homes of almost every ethnic group in Ethiopia. I've been the guest of people from the Tigray region, the uh, Muslim families, Christian families, Amhara families, Oromo families. Uh, I have I have a deep love for all of the people of Ethiopia, and as you said at the beginning, any life that is endangered, any person that is is in danger of harm, we're all concerned about. And therefore, a rumor about the city of Axum 
must be carefully, carefully looked at and be sure that it is valid and that uh, justice is, is truly served. Quick question yes. uh, before you continue, because I know uh, you have more to say. Yes. Um, so who are the writers for these um, mm -hmm. two, uh, uh, two articles from um, the Christian Times or, uh, or the other one? Is, was it just uh, an article that was out by the organization itself? Or is it, it was obviously there was no corroboration. It was here, you know, here, Shay, there is, you know, sort of like a kind of news article. There, there are um, bylines uh, mm -hmm. at the bottom of journalists. I don't have the names in front of me. I can get them okay. to you. I'd be happy to email them to you. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not, uh, you know, in other words, the, the, the publication is writing it. And as I uh, read to you, they're saying, we're not even sure if it happened. Uh, so I would, I think it's their responsibility to correct it. Uh, unfortunately, Lydette, what we're dealing with here also is a lot of racism toward Africa, that the myth, if you will, the false racist myth of American journalism is Africans are always killing each other. So here's just another massacre. Let's print it. You know, why try to verify it? Uh, if this were an accusation uh, going on in any European city, even if it were 10 people who were killed, they should, it should be investigated and verified. And the other myth that I've been very puzzled by is we all know that for about 10 years, there's been kind of a cell phone revolution in Africa. People have those as a very important part of their lives. Rural people have them, you know, everyone has them because it makes life easier. It makes life uh, not just uh, communication wise, but you know, you could take photos of your family and that type of thing. So even if you were to assume that in the city of Axum from the 20th to the 29th, uh, the internet was shut down, the um, electricity was off. There had to be some charge in someone's phone to take some proof, some evidence. Oh my God, look what's going on. The first thing they would do is take out their camera and either take pictures or you know, a photograph or a video or that kind of thing. Uh, the other um, assumption uh, that I think the, the white journalists or white media, if you will, in the West, doesn't uh, understand is there are security cameras. You know, Axum is not, you know, a, a desolated place. It, it has modern facilities and many places need to have security cameras, including the, um, you know, the warehouses and factories and places that people work. So they have hard drives. And if you're a journalist, you'll go and say, you know, can I see those? Um, so now we're at March 22nd, I'm sorry, uh, March uh, 21st, 2021, and we still don't, we're over 110 days from this alleged uh, massacre, and we still don't have any footage. And uh, I mean, uh, at that time, um, there was obviously issues uh, um, with uh, uh, electricity and uh, people were not, um, journalists were not allowed to, uh, to enter um, uh, due to the conflict going on. Um, but now, um, uh, you know, a lot of people are able to go in. So, okay, continue. So um, continue with the amnesty report. Yeah, so essentially, again, in the context of what's going on now, I think we're at a point where it is one part of a picture being painted where we, we have the president sending a senator from Delaware to send a message to the government that they're concerned about uh, what is going on in Tigray. So if a report such as Amnesty is brought to that senator's attention, we have to also give information and analysis around what is actually in the report. The headline itself, uh, even though I think it, it, it says uh, Axum Massacre or uh, Massacre at Axum, 
that's a conclusion that, you know, what is in there doesn't corroborate. I'll give you uh, one other example. Um, the uh, satellite pictures, they're relying on satellite pictures to uh, verify that there are what they call fresh graves. So if we think about fresh graves in particular, uh, satellites are hovering at about 300 kilometers in the atmosphere. Um, what you may see as a fresh grave could be many things. It could be, uh, it could be graves from another burial. It could be uh, agricultural work. It could be construction work. Uh, to label it fresh graves from a particular massacre requires corroboration. It requires people to be going in and saying, okay, this was the location. Let me go in with my cameras and look at what's there. Um, but we haven't seen that. Um, again, I have, I have immense respect for Amnesty International. I wish they would have come forward with all that prior to uh, issuing this report. The other thing that is in these satellite uh, images is what they call evidence of looting. Okay, so let's assume for the sake of argument, it actually is evidence of looting. Well, who looted? When did they loot? And, you know, do you have any security camera footage of that to corroborate it? Uh, what was stolen? Um, th th those are unclear. Just to say that there's evidence of looting, you can't say this means that any particular group of soldiers were on a rampage that comes to uh, mean war crimes or human, you know, uh, crimes against humanity or something like that. Uh, they, you know, they, they have a gold standard, if you will, of human rights reporting. In fact, that I'll tell you that I knew two people in Ethiopia whose lives were saved by Amnesty International t uh, 10 years ago, of uh, 15 years ago even. Uh, they were in prison. They were facing the death penalty. And Amnesty International came to advocate for them and they were released, uh, among other advocacies. So I, I have a deep respect for them and a deep, you know, uh, anytime I've been able to donate or support them, I will. Uh, so therefore, uh, what I explain to the people on Twitter is I'm not new to Ethiopia. You know, I've been working with and uh, people from Ethiopia and tra I've traveled there three times and studying Ethiopia since 1996. Uh, and that's just from the firsthand knowledge. So therefore I'm bringing my criticism and my constructive criticism uh, from that point of view. Again, I want to emphasize since there is a UN and Ethiopian Human Rights Commission study going on, I don't want anything I say here to, you know, be critical of that or to in any way take away from that important work. And the more we move forward in some uh, cohesive way, the better. In fact, uh, one thing I've been writing on Twitter that you may have picked up on is I believe strongly in the power of information. Uh, for example, the more I know about you as an individual, the more I can respect you and the more we can communicate. Uh, you know, this is, I'm saying you as an individual, meaning people generally. And the same is true for countries. I don't think in America, uh, I don't think 90% of the American voters could even locate Ethiopia on a map if it were not labeled. Um, and if you took the Senate, or the Congress out of 436 <laughs> members and gave them a quiz about Ethiopia, I would bet anything that they would fail that quiz. And that is, you know, disgraceful for me as an American, but also shows how much work we have to do. Um, you know, I've sat down with people who are very, in very high sophisticated positions, some who are African American, some you know, who are just very uh, thoughtful, studied people. And they all, you know, present something about Africa that's just totally wrong. Um, to lump, for example, this stereotype of corrupt dictators, which is another thing that is, they're, they're trying to stigmatize Prime Minister Abbey with, 
that he's just another corrupt dictator. Yes, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, he helped bring in, uh, you know, reforms. But now he's a corrupt dictator. And, it, you know, it's like less than a year from all that wonderfulness. You know, I would like to say something tonight to you that it, I'm not, you know, gung-ho propagandist or anything like that for anybody. Uh, I, I think the best friend you could have is someone who's critical and tells you not what you want to hear, but what you should be hearing. But we have to give credit where credit is due. Prime Minister Abbey is a young man. He's a doctor. He's a medical doctor, from what I understand. And I'm sorry, I can't hear you. No, he's he is a PhD. He's a PhD. My mistake. Again, better to, to talk about it. Yeah. But... <laughs> Some of the reforms he brings in, we don't even have here in the United States. He brought, he insisted that his cabinet, his advisors be half 50% women. And 50% of the cabinet, the minister, ministers of different uh, parts of the government are women in Ethiopia. That's yes, an African country where the men are supposed to be so chauvinistic and, and, and you know, sexist and all the rest. And he also was part of the atmosphere that brought in a woman president of Ethiopia. And as the last I checked, uh, there's also a woman chief justice of the Supreme Court. Okay. So, you know, we can watch all the movies we want about the notorious RBG. She was never the chief justice. And this woman in Ethiopia is the chief justice of the Supreme Court. So, going after this man and trying to put him in kind of, you know, put him, make him another Robert Mugabe is absolutely unconscionable. It's unconscionable. And the fact that he is basically being sucked into a conflict that he didn't, he didn't choose is again, unconscionable. I, I want to just also say something with that about what I understand about the undisputed facts of what happened in Tigray. Uh, from what I understand, this group that ended up leading the insurrection, it's a small group of, of men and a few women, were part of the central government in Ethiopia and ruled for since 1991, since the fall of Mengistu, the communist dictator. And they had many, many human rights problems, human rights abuses. So when Prime Minister Abe took power in 2018, these folks were given the option to basically leave. And what they did, from what I understand, is they went to Mekele, the Tigray regional capital, and they formed a basically government of a province of Ethiopia, not a separate nation, but a province. But at some point, they started to find ways to um, instigate. And one of the major ways they found was to uh, declare an election in the middle of the COVID crisis. So where the prime minister was trying to reduce COVID and postpone the election, they insisted on having the election in September of 2020, which was unauthorized. Now, whether those you know, results were recognized or not is another issue. But what is undisputed by them, by everyone in the world community, is that they attacked a federal military installation. And when a group of people attack a federal military installation in any country, there has to be some law enforcement. There has to be some repercussions. If we allowed the governor of Texas to attack a federal military installation, we'd have another civil war in the United States. And then on November 4th, again, an undisputed fact is that Prime Minister Abe took the law enforcement measures. And now we are in a, a post law enforcement period, if you will, where things are a new administration in the Tigray region is in power, which is a legitimate part of the uh, Ethiopian uh, national government. And they are trying to bring stability and a sense of normalcy after this disruption. Um, without getting into you know, all the personalities and all the other uh, factors, 
I, I wanted to reflect on a dynamic that I struggle with as an Italian American. As you know, in Italy, uh, there is something called the mafia. Now, these people operate not just in Italy and Napoli, the region where my family was from, but they operate here in New York. Now, the question is, how do we law-abiding citizens and people of goodwill target them and keep them away from our lives and not let them lead us into terrible things, okay? So if you have a small group of criminals and they lead people into something illegal, everyone needs to coalesce and bring them to justice and not, you know, say, well, they're part of our town, they're part of our ethnic group, therefore we're not, you know, going to turn them in or, or, or understand their unlawfulness. These are criminals and they're doing criminal acts. And um, short of, you know, overusing the stereotype or the, the word mafia, which I, I won't use in this circumstance, I understand the dynamics of people feeling the fear of a small group of people and then not wanting to uh, follow them into their destruction and also seeking to be part of a normal life that was before they brought, they came into the picture. And ultimately, you know, the people of Ethiopia deserve uh, peace and tranquility. They deserve uh, justice and a, a sense of, of everyday normalcy and life. Uh, one of the uh, reports that I saw on one of the online, um, you know, stations showed a bustling market in uh, the Tigray region. People crowded everywhere getting food. And the white British interpretation of it was they're panicking. They're not panicking. This is called a market. <laughs> you know, people are bargaining. And the way you bargain in some regions of different parts of the world is not the way we bargain in the United States. You know, They're not going to go up to them and scan their, their, their iPhone against a uh, scanner. They're going to talk to the person and maybe hug them or maybe, you know, kiss their hand or, you know, hold the, the material like in an aggressive way. But it's it, these are symbols of trade. These are the way people communicate uh, trade. So, again, you have to have some cultural literacy as a journalist and, and competence when you go into a situation like this. Uh, may I mention a, an article that I just saw in The New York Times? Uh no, go ahead, sure. Okay, so th this is kind of a good example. Uh, the the uh, writer, the journalist is a man named Declan Walsh. And he wrote this very extensive article about Tigray, heartbreaking, horrific, horrific accounts, which I would want to see if they're verified and the people brought to justice who allegedly did any of this. But my simple question was to him as a journalist, do you speak Tigray? Do you speak Amharic? Do you speak these languages? It's not a disqualifier. It just gives me some more understanding of how much you know firsthand of what you heard. And if you don't, who are the people who came with you and guided you and supported you? I think at the bottom of the New York Times article, it said something to the effect of, a New York Times employee contributed to this from Ethiopia. Well, you're the New York Times. Can I hear the name of this person? Can you describe this person to us? Did Mr. Uh, you know, Declan Walsh do most of this remotely? Did he just sit there and listen to the interpreter and write down what the person said? Were there ways to verify it? You know, I, I would guess that it makes more sense um, to send people such as yourself, Ladette, or other people who are fluent in both English and the local languages to, you know, speak to people and to report. Short of that, I would guess there's some good technology out there where you could record someone's statement and then, you know, have it transcribed or put through, you know, the equivalent of um, Alexa and have that that translated, they, they do it at the UN every day where people put on headphones and they hear, you know, different languages interpreted to them instantly. Um, so I, I am concerned that Ethiopia is being lumped into the, oh, there they go again. The Africans are fighting again, you know, just 
give me some pictures, give me some accusations and we'll print it. And in the meantime, a country is trying to build a future. Uh, when I was there in 96, it's, it was a totally different place than it is today. Uh, and fortunately, there's been tremendous uh, progress and uh, the famines of the 80s are, are long, long, long past to the point where by the time I left in 97, my last trip, Ethiopia was exporting uh, food. Yeah. You know, um, when you said about collaboration and who's helping the journalists or the, um, the reporters uh, get stories, um, one of the things I feel as an Ethiopian American, um, uh, which, could, which could be um, my opinion, or um, I, I believe many people share, um, and I've been closely following uh, Human Rights Watch, especially um, about, um, about the concerns or about the, um, the situation of Ethiopia even prior to this. And I, I honestly uh, found a lot of unethical, instigating, um, almost, it, it's not warning, because warning to me would be you know, there, these are the issues going on and Ethiopia needs to work on this. That's absolutely acceptable. But what I, I, what I noticed um, uh, significantly was um, uh, a propaganda type of uh, information where, um, like you said, um, the Ethiopian government is obviously brand new. In my opinion, a brand new uh, government that's transitioning that is looking forward to an election has no um, no intention or has no benefit in creating a chaos, attacking its own citizens, um, uh, alienating any region. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. But I have seen time and time again human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch um, instigating. Um, uh, ethnic uh, divisions, um, because to me, I feel like that's not really their job. Mm -hmm. I mean, we obviously, I, I mean, there are people that are very uh, um, strong-minded about this, that there's obviously needs to happen, then obviously some change, some revolution needs to happen on the way things are done. Mm -hmm. um, that's in every organization, you know? Um, and I was really alarmed with the amount of side taking, um, not always being uh, neutral, um, almost instigating and almost encouraging conflict. I mean, that is, that is a serious issue. Um, and that's, as an Ethiopian American, I saw that. I saw that these organizations were, okay, are you really looking for humans' rights? or you're looking for chaos so you can, you can be used as human rights. It's almost like an entrepreneurship of, uh, of conflict. Mm -hmm. And I feel like some of the um, reports, like you said, um, you know, what's the rush? To me, in order for you to bring, you know, uh, bring out a report uh, that's that extensive, knowing the amount of uh, the amount of people that are going to be affected by this kind of report. It's neither alarming anyone because it's already happened. That's what we're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Why not collaborate? Why not verify? Why not have facts instead of he said, she said, no pictures. Um, and then the sad part is, there was actually a lot of other uh, information such as holidays that was reported and was nationally televised. Uh, there was statements from the TPLF leader about um, what was happening during that time that didn't match the amnesty report. Um, yes. So there, it's several things that are not, um, that, that, that makes you question about this report. And what do you think about that? Well, I, I think, um, put it this way, again, 
uh, I may have explained this to you uh, in our previous conversations, but I try to look at it as give their arguments all the benefits of the doubt. In other words, take everything they've said as true. Does it still amount to what they conclude? And my opinion is no. Okay. So if you take the details of their report and try to match it with their conclusion, they don't go together. So I, again, hesitate to point the finger and say there's a um, money making here. What I would say, which I agree with you about, is people do become either witting or unwitting uh, speak spokespeople and manipulators of certain political agendas. Uh, if I could just deviate a little bit in terms of this, but it's relevant. I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in the country of Namibia. Now, as you know, Namibia left uh, the apartheid era in 1990. Excuse the background noise, sorry. In, they left the um, apartheid era in 1990. When we arrived as Peace Corps volunteers in 1998, we were mostly a white group from America meeting people who really had been born into slavery. They were slaves. Uh, unless they were, you know, seven years old, they were born into slavery. Uh, and I struggled being a little older than the other volunteers and having done, uh, had, had traveled to Ethiopia already three times. I struggled with my fellow white volunteers to let them know there's a history here, there's a culture here that you can't come in with your own preconceived notions. You have to learn from people here. Listen to what they're telling you. Even if they're telling you things that sound antagonistic toward you as a white person, they just escaped white oppression, okay? They don't see you as a person here to help so much until you show that you're really there to help. So what it goes to is, you know, here we are, white volunteers, we're starting to see the news of, you know, the, the Sam Nioma, who was the first president who was still in power, uh, God bless him. He was the leader of the Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO, and he was the president. Now here's a bearded, you know, very big, uh, older African man and what you start to hear in the subconscious of a lot of white volunteers, uh, British volunteers that I met, Australian volunteers, one that I had a roommate with, is, oh, he's a dictator. He's a dictator, why? Give me a specific reason. Because you're in Africa and because he's a male and because he's leading a country? What makes you believe that a country in Africa doesn't have the right to have a leader like we do in any white or European or Western country and not call him a dictator automatically. It's like a knee jerk reaction. And it really upset me because here's a man who liberated his country from slavery. And they have the nerve to insinuate that he is somehow a dictator. For what? And then when I, I had done workshops with them, I was the chairman of what was called the diversity committee. And I was asked by the government that I was there with the United States Peace Corps to train new volunteers. I showed them, you know, video about Nelson Mandela because that Namibia was part of uh, South Africa at one point. And, you know, I asked them a, a very simple question, which amendment in the United States Constitution guarantees the right to an education? Of course, they couldn't, they couldn't tell me because there is none. There's no constitutional right. I can't hear you, Lidette. I'm sorry. There, there's no constitutional right to an education in America, but in Namibia, there is. There is a constitutional right to an education, and not only that, but we as volunteers were operating under that constitutional amendment, training teachers and training, you know, teaching young kids who had been in slavery. So it goes to what you're saying that either wittingly or unwittingly because of their conditioning. Now we have this term in America, intrinsic racism, the way we're raised as white people to be racist, which I believe is true. And when you go to Africa, either as a volunteer or a journalist or, you know, development work or 
whatever, you have to fight those conditionings. You have to understand what is making me perceive this and what is making me take, hey, this person just walked up to me and told me that they were and somehow, you know, their human rights were violated. Okay, let me see who is this person. Are they possibly, you know, working for a rebel group? If they're not, I need to take down their information. I need to find out, just like a, a detective in any crime scene, what happened, okay? So there I agree with you. And may I continue with something regarding newsrooms, if I may? Yes, yes. Newsrooms sure. and the executives of these human rights, very reputable organizations that I respect, the executives and the directors and the supervisors must look at the information given to them and analyze it. If I'm the producer at CNN and someone says to me, uh, you know, this happened in Axum, the first thing I'm going to say is, do you have a photograph of the in incident? Do you have a video like we're seeing out of Myanmar or like we saw in the George Floyd uh, murder? Do you have such a video? Do you even have a, you know, a video of someone f running by? Anything. At this point, here we are in March, and this allegedly happened in November. We have not seen one person say, oh, now I remember. I have this photograph from that night. You know, or I have this video. Or I text my friend for help. Or I tried to call, but there was no internet. If you tried to call and there was no internet or, or you know, a phone service, your, your phone is likely going to show that you tried to make that call. I mean, the point is, there's so many ways for senior people. But what I'm seeing like with CNN, for example, is just a kind of lazy kind of racism. Oh yeah, it, it happened in Africa. The one tribe is killing another tribe. They call them tribes when they're really ethnic groups. You know, one, one group is killing another group. Yes, print it, run it, good. And by the way, you know, the people buying our products for our commercial sponsors are gonna be glued to the television. No. Don't try to sell false things. Don't try to sell uncorroborated things to the public. We have a right to know. And, you know, it has, it has deep implications. You know, when people use the term uh, Black Lives Matter, that has to apply to Africa. I mean, you can't just say, you know, a, a country, a sovereign country like Ethiopia, like Namibia, like Egypt or, or Liberia, what goes on there can just be skirted over and pushed on the news uh, at whim. You have to analyze what's going on. And I put it on the producers. I put it on the senior editors um, to be careful and just ask common sense investigative questions. Don't just say, oh, this person has an African last name. They gave me the report. I'm printing it. No, you have to ask those questions. You would ask if they were reporting from a street in Chicago or Atlanta or wherever. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna go back and um, since uh, you said um, you assume that whatever report was written is, is true and then you go and um, ask questions to where the proof is for the, you know, parts for, for the things that are in the report. Um, and, you've raised obviously uh, great questions to why the report doesn't um, uh, necessarily mean uh, what they said or what their conclusion is because they haven't really provided substantial evidence. Um, my question is, let's assume that it does not have substantial evidence, which we already did, but let's say this was wrong. Mm -hmm. This didn't happen. Um, because as of right now, um, just talking about the details of what really happened on the dates that they have said does not match with what has happened uh, on the ground. So as an Ethiopian American citizens who are concerned about this report, what, what are the steps that they need to take uh, whenever there is a report that's coming out out of you know, about Ethiopia, uh, both for Ethiopian Americans and both uh, for Ethiopians. Uh, I've noticed that some uh, organizations uh, like BBC has apologized about a report 
that they've done in the past. Um, uh, and I think even Human Rights Watch has uh, apologized about a certain um, information. Um, CNN uh, also has used uh, an old video and reported it as it was happening and they have mentioned uh, that it was an error as well. Um, what should we do uh, whenever we see something? Because like you said, this, is, this might just be a small decision. Yes, go with it or don't go with it. But mm -hmm. to people on the ground, mm -hmm. these are sensitive issues. Yes. These are issues that cause ethnic problems. These yes. are issues that could cause civil um, wars. These are serious, serious matters. Yes. And like you said, Black Lives Matter, because we are not being considered um, our human rights, in fact, is not being considered when reckless reports come out because yes. uh, it really affects um, uh, what's going on in Ethiopia. So how do you fight that? How do you not just fight it, but actually go about it in a way where we're, we're, we're not trying to bring the house down or we're not really trying to say that all the great things that a certain organization has done um, is, is going down the drain. We just want, you know, a clear um, way to fight this. What are your recommendations since you've been, you know, since you are in law and yes. in grassroots movements? Thank you. In one word, vote. V-O-T-E. Make sure you are registered to vote and you do it. Even if you're voting in a local school board election, get your name on those registration forms and vote, okay? These reports, these uh, organizations ultimately want to have an impact on the body politic. They, they Sure, they have a donor base. They wanna make the donor base feel that they're doing a job, but what the donor base wants to see is that they are affecting policies so that people's human rights are protected. So let's assume for, you know, for the sake of um, argument and also what I believe, I believe Amnesty International is well-intentioned. I know a lot of people disagree with me, but I do believe they are well-intentioned. I believe their donors are well-intentioned. And I believe what they would wanna see in most places in the world is that their audience, if you will, the American public, are looking at, for example, Myanmar and condemning the military um, uh, coup there, which is undisputably true. Everyone condemns that. Also, the, the dictator in Philippines, Amnesty is doing excellent reporting about his abuse and just using his own words, you know, you just let, let him speak and he will make his own case against his human rights uh, record. Um, so when I say vote, if we vote and we have this knowledge that there is no substantial proof of an Axum massacre, for example, when you vote, you call up your local representative, your congressman, your senator. Now I would encourage people uh, to call the Senate and also, you know, Twitter, let them know what the truth is. Well, let them know what the facts are. Let them know how important the city is and how explosive the insinuation that there was a massacre is and where, what the sources of that were first coming from. For example, the New York Post and this other uh, organization. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not one of these people who says, you know, throw them out of the country or, you know, take away their, their right to report or anything like that. I think they can reform, they could find their ways to investigate and reform and, and issue a correction or if need be an apology, you know, these things happen, people make mistakes. But ultimately, if we, if we get ourselves to the polls, if we're voting in numbers in Atlanta, for example, and making sure, you know, the people we want are speaking about the facts that are important, uh, no matter what they say, we have the, the last word, the people who are you know, passionate about human rights. Uh, and uh, so again, I don't wanna see 
uh, any country falsely maligned or any person for that matter. And I definitely don't want to see uh, Prime Minister Abe misunderstood. And he's not a perfect human being. You know, for example, I said he was a medical doctor. He's a PhD, which is just as wonderful and, and intelligent. Uh, but I, I had it wrong. Uh, I, he's not, you know, I'm not trying to say he's a saint. Uh, I'm also not trying to say he's Adolf Hitler. You know, he's Prime Minister Abe, and he is trying to build a, a future for everyone. Uh, there are genuine disputes as to what he is doing, and there are genuine concerns. I say, you know, in America, we can't isolate him. We can't, uh, you know, demonize him. We can't demonize the country. And for someone to just say, oh, the Eritreans massacred 800 people in the holy city of Aksum, I better see some real concrete proof of that. Because that, you know, you've just told me the, the equivalent of, you know, uh, Yugoslavian troops just massacred people in the Vatican, or French troops just marched into the Vatican and slaughtered 800 people. Why? How? Where are the pictures? Thank you. And that's, um, I mean, uh, you kind of also uh, referred to um, the mafia before. And um, like you said, uh, you don't have to use the same name, <laughs> but um, the net, one, of the, one of the biggest um, and the toughest thing that Ethiopia is going through is, um, you know, a group of leaders who have, um, basically um, led Ethiopia for 30 years, um, the amount of power, uh, the amount of finances, the amount of uh, relationships of, uh, that they have built in 30 years is unmatched. Um, and the fear that they bring upon people is totally unmatched. And there's a lot of fear. I mean, I even get messages from people who tell me they're afraid to speak out. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to speak out mm -hmm. because they're from that region. Mm -hmm. And um, because it's almost like uh, you, you don't want to speak against them. It's, 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 it's quite uh, a scary thing. And um, so the network is huge. Uh, mm -hmm. And that network, uh, to me, uh, is the reason why... Um, you know, the country had to take the measure that they had to take because it was it was a very dangerous measure attacking the uh, the, the federal uh, force. And then even after that, you know, what would have happened is a dangerous situation to, for the country. Yes. Having said that, why is the image of Ethiopia? Uh, I mean, like you said, because you know Ethiopia. What are some of the things that you aspire for Ethiopia? What are some of the things that can can go from you know from from now on? We obviously have a lot of challenges. There's a lot of work that you need to do. Um, you gave me only one uh, strategy: is vote. Mm -hmm. um, I think Americans actually really um, uh, Ethiopian Americans and Eritrean Americans um, um, mobilized for this past. U.S. elections. Yes, um, we um, organized in every state, uh, and passionately. Yes, passionately. And I mean, um, the, we're obviously um, in a situation right now uh, where we're not really happy about the some of the responses that we've gotten from our leaders, because to to Ethiopians especially. Uh, this is something that people fought. Ethiop Ethiopian American, not Ethiopian Americans, but Ethiopians, some Ethiopian Americans who actually fought this uh, for, for this change. And now everything that we're hearing is, is vilifying the change that we have actually worked for instead of it being the other way around. And we feel unsupported in this case. And we feel that Ethiopia is actually in more of an danger because of what's going on. Yes, we'll obviously be organizing to vote again, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I mean, in my opinion, a majority of um, um, 
Ethiopians and Eritreans um, have really contributed in, in voting. So I'm looking yes. to, to get another, you know, other advices because let's turn this around and say, okay, we, we recently just had um, um, Asian, Asian Lives Matter, you know? Yes, um, yes. And if there was a misreport done about the situation, what are some of the outrages that we're, we're going to be hearing? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, uh, I feel like um, even when we find a report that's wrong or that's unfair, or when we are uh, facing big organizations or corporations, either we need, either we need um, more coordination or we, we don't, we're not getting uh, enough attention for our causes. Mm -hmm. um, do we matter? Uh, what are we lacking? Because I, I, I just, I can't imagine uh, reports coming out about the U.S. that would instigate division between Americans mm -hmm. and that being okay. Exactly. Well, I, I'll just start by saying it's very nuanced and as you know, human beings and, and we're all in not perfect as human beings, we have to accept that there is nuance and imperfection, that there's no specific one uh, question uh, or, or, or answer, I should say, to the whole picture. Uh, with that said, I just want to tell you that I am um, successful in two major campaigns, one of them as a college student in the divestment movement. And the other is uh, helping to restore the Axum obelisk. And in both of those situations, we had virtually no money. I was a complete volunteer. And I'm not saying that all this can be done without, volunteer, without money, but when I saw the recent demonstrations throughout the United States in Las Vegas, Atlanta, Washington, DC, of Eritrean and Ethiopian people beautifully celebrating and Washington DC, celebrating in the streets their peace and, and friendship and their denunciation of the uh, rebels, uh, the insurrectionists in uh, the Tigray region. That's inspiring. Now, what can happen easily, Ledette, uh, you just remind me how much time we have if we're running out of time. Yeah, okay. that's okay. You can continue. Okay. What, what, what we have to remember when we're marching in the streets and we go out and we feel that camaraderie and that energy, we know that the whole day was filled with solidarity. We know that there were at least 3,000 people with us, at least. And you won't see anything in the press unless you dig. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. What you need to do is focus that energy again. Focus it on voting. Focus it on letter writing. Don't give up. You know, I would go to demonstrations when Reagan took power in the 80s. The first one was 1981. There were at least a million people there. It was wall-to-wall -wall people in Washington, D.C. Everywhere you looked were people. There were buses on the highway. All along the highway were just busloads of people. The next day, the Park Service, run by Reagan, said that about 150,000 people were there which is you know, totally wrong. 10 times more people were there. We, you know, we felt a little discouraged. We're also like, wait, that's just one article. We, we want more publicity. So it's important as activists and people who care to first of all, not seek perfection in the solution, but also not be discouraged and understand that this is an ongoing movement. It's always a movement toward trying to make things better. Uh, with regard, I, as I said, with regard to Ethiopia, there are nuanced solutions. Uh, if you look at the past 40 years in Ethiopia alone, you know, 40 years ago, we're looking at 1981. And, uh, you know, we, it's still under the communist dictatorship. D does anyone in the world outside of Ethiopia really understand what happened under that dictatorship? So you went from 1974 with a, uh, you know, a, the royal family, Emperor Haile Selassie, some people would argue a, a feudal system, non-democratic, 
to a, a harsh dictatorship, one of the worst communist dictatorships in history, to the TPLF that took power in, in 1991. And then within all that, you have the underlying discussions about who people are in different regions. You know, the, what we call tribes, what we call, uh, you know, ethnic groups, what we call religions, you know, uh, they, they play a part. So if someone is Afar, for example, in the uh, northeast region of Ethiopia, I believe they also border Eritrea, if I'm not mistaken, they have distinct features that are part of their culture. Now, do they hate because they are Afar? Do they just hate everyone else? No. They are part of an identity that is Ethiopian. Just as an American, I'm a New Yorker. I don't hate everyone from every other state you know, or even being an Italian American. I love my heritage. That doesn't mean I hate someone who's Irish American or Filipino American or black American. I can love myself and love them too. They're not, you know, exclu mutually exclusive. So there are a lot of different things that have to be worked on, but misinformation and false information are completely destructive. That's why I'm working so hard on Twitter and I appreciate your invitation so much tonight to give my opinion and my, my findings. Thank you, Nicola. Um, again, I know we want to continue and we have a lot to talk about, but I'm hoping that you will come back again. Um, Thank you. And we'll have another discussion. I know we're running out of time. Um, I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, for Same here. Time. Thank it's such an much. honor. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I have so much respect for your work and your advocacy because you. You, 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 you are obviously humble, but you do so much to inform people, you know, in, in your work. And this program is so important for people to get information and to, to debate the issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.